Bueno, muy buenos días a todas las personas que se conectan a esta sesión informativa de Ecofuturo con la Universidad de Durham en Reino Unido. Hoy nos acompaña Nathan, representante de esta universidad, quien nos brindará información de utilidad tanto sobre la universidad, la oferta académica, proceso de admisión y demás información relevante para que ustedes puedan iniciar su proceso de postulación a los programas de esta universidad. Quiero mencionar que, como probablemente muchos de ustedes ya lo saben, Colfuturo tiene un convenio con esta universidad que les puede brindar una beca del 100% para un beneficiario de Colfuturo y 20% de descuento sobre el valor de la matrícula para todos los demás seleccionados. Así que si alguno está interesado en la oferta académica de esta universidad, para poder acceder a este beneficio debe postularse al programa Crédito Beca de Colfuturo cuya convocatoria abrirá el próximo año 2024, específicamente el 9 de enero y cerrará el 29 de febrero. Así que la invitación es escojan uno de los programas si es de su interés de Durham University, postúlense con ese programa a Colfuturo y si son seleccionados por nosotros podrían adquirir ya sea el 100% o el 20% de descuento en el valor de la matrícula. Así que ya con eso dicho, eh, me gustaría igualmente recordarles que si tienen preguntas, si hay dudas, pueden escribirlas en la cajita de Q&A y al final de la sesión vamos a responder cada una de ellas con la ayuda de Nate. Así que cualquier duda, ahí pueden enviar esas preguntas que vayan surgiendo. Y sin más introducción, thank you so much, Nathan, for being here and you can go ahead and start the presentation. Thank you very much, Lady. It's um, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and I look forward to everyone's questions towards the end of the session. Um, before I get into an introduction about Durham University, um, I thought I would just go through the kinds of things that you might want to consider when you're applying to postgraduate up to postgraduate degrees in the UK. So this is just going to be a general introduction as to uh, what you might want to include in your personal statement or motivation letters when considering UK universities. So what is the point of a personal statement or motivation letter? So different universities throughout the UK might call this a different thing at the postgraduate level. So at Durham we call it personal statement, other universities might call it a motivation letter. But really, this is your opportunity to share more about yourself that hasn't already been covered elsewhere in your postgraduate application. So in all of your applications to postgraduate courses uh, within the UK, there'll be a section on your basic details. So your name, your age, your, your, your the country that you're living in, your address, that kind of thing. It will also ask you about your qualifications, so your high school qualifications, uh, your undergraduate degree as well. Um, and that will be your performance within those within those classes and within those within those uh, uh, degrees. Um, but the personal statement is really your opportunity to add meat to the bones of that detail. It's your opportunity to talk about yourself and really to talk about why you um, are a good fit for the program that you are applying to. So I'll just move on to the next slide. So what should it do? What should the personal statement do? It should show a genuine subject interest, why you are individually very interested in the programme that you are applying to, why you are enthusiastic about it. It should demonstrate a good fit between you and that course, and it should display your potential within that course as well. So it should show a core knowledge and technical fluency. So particularly if you have done an undergraduate uh, programme in the same subject, and then you are applying to a postgraduate program in that same subject, you should have a good core knowledge of that subject by that point. So that's your opportunity to talk about what you might have covered within your undergraduate program and how you expect that to develop within that postgraduate program in the UK. Um, it should show focus and determination. You should be enthusiastic about the program that you're applying to. You should it, it should it should show that level of determination that you really want to apply and study that program. And obviously an ability to learn independently. You will have done a lot of this at the undergraduate level anyway, but it's a step up once you get to postgraduate study yet again. There's a lot of individual learning, a lot of research involved in the um, in the postgraduate degrees in the UK. So you need to be able to show that you can work and learn independently. 
It should also indicate a vocational commitment where applicable and where appropriate. So particularly if you are applying to programs in the business school, for example, or maybe in engineering or other STEM subjects or any other subject, really. Um, but particularly if they are those vocational focus programs, you should talk about where you want to go on to afterwards, uh, what career you would like to go into. If you would like to continue in academia, then do talk about that there as well. But this is where you should be mentioning those types of that type of information, really. So just a few tips um, when you're writing your personal statement or motivation letter. Be honest and you'd use your own voice. Um, I've read a number of personal statements myself where you can sort of you can sort of tell where people are trying to use flowery language or, or words that might make them sound clever. But really, all we're looking for is your enthusiasm for the subject and why you are appropriate for it. So please use your own voice, use your own tone, use your own tone and demonstrate why you have chosen the course that you're applying to. So outline your subject in the interest, sorry, outline your interest in the subject rather and analyze what you've done to learn or prepare. So particularly if you are applying to uh, a postgraduate program that is different to your undergraduate program, how have you bridged that gap already? What, what research have you done um, to ensure that you know that the course that you're applying to is what you expect it to be? Maybe what readings you've done um, and why you're interested in it. It should be primarily academic in focus as well, as you might imagine. So at least 80% of it should be purely academic. Why you are interested in that program, uh, what reading you've done already, which aspect of your undergraduate degree interested you most um, and why you are applying to the programme and what academic aspects of it you are most interested in. So that comes down to supercurricular versus extracurricular. So as I mentioned, at least 80% of your personal statement should be academic in focus. So you should use those supercurricular examples throughout that 80%. So um, academic and focus, demonstrate your subject interest, how you've developed research skills, show that you can work independently and be self-motivated, and how you have broadened your subject knowledge to date already. And then extracurricular activities can be the things that you've done outside of the classroom, the lecture theatre, the tutorial room, um, outside of your university experience, maybe even, or the extracurricular activities that you have engaged in at the undergraduate bachelor's level. So you can talk about your hobbies, your sports, your interests, if you play an interest, non-academic achievements, volunteering that you might have done, um, Work experience as well is something that is worth mentioning and traveling. So you can talk about that within your personal statement. Um, but re do remember that all activities should in some way um, relate back to the subject that you're applying to. So that was just a very quick overview of some things to consider when you are applying to the UK and things that you can include in your personal statement or motivation letter. So I'm going to move on to um, an introduction to Durham University. So this is where I will talk exclusively about Durham University. Um, if anyone has any questions throughout, please do feel free to put them in the chat and I'll be able to get to them at the end. Um, but just to give an overview of Durham University, we were established in 1832, making us England's third oldest university after Oxford and Cambridge, which it's, it's very likely that you've heard of as well. So we were the next university to be established in England after Oxford and, and, and Cambridge had existed for over a thousand years. Um, we're not as old as some of the Scottish universities, but in England, we do hold that third place in terms of age. Much of our... Um, of our site is part of a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So the cathedral that you can see on the screen here is part of the UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's not strictly part of the university, but back in 1832, the university was established by the Bishop of Durham at the time, Bishop Van Mildert. And this is the cathedral that was part of, of, the, of the bishop's uh, responsibilities, but he also lived in the castle, which is directly the opposite the cathedral, which you can just see behind me here as well. Um, the castle was gifted to the university by Bishop Van Mildred, and it is now um, part of the university. It's one of our 17 colleges of residence. 
So in a similar way to Oxford and Cambridge, Durham is a collegiate university. And I'll get onto what that means in a few minutes time. Um, but essentially it means that you are part of both an academic department within the university. So that might be physics, engineering, mathematics, but then you will also be a member of one of our 17 colleges. Um, so St. Mary's College, for example, University College, St. Chad's, and that will be where you live um, potentially within your year at the university if you do postgraduate degree. We have just over 20,000 students at the university. Um, around two thirds are undergraduate and around a third are postgraduate students. Um, and at the start of this year, actually, we were ranked the 26th most international university in the world. So Durham really is an international university with a global outlook. Um, and over a third of our students are from outside of the United Kingdom. Um, and we have over 120 nationalities represented within our student body. So it really is a diverse community of students. Uh, much of our staff body is international as well. Um, and part of that 26th um, most international university ranking came as part of that international student makeup, but also our international makeup of um, staff as well. The university is currently engaged in over £700 million investment into the university site as well. We're five years into that investment. So if you were to decide to come to Durham, you really would see the fruits of that investment. Uh, for example, we anticipate opening a brand new faculty of business building within the next 18 months or so. Um, in the last two years, we've opened up a brand new £80 million um, Department of Computer Science and Department of Mathematical Sciences. Um, so a lot of money has been spent um, on different departments, but we've also opened up two brand new residential colleges as well. So if you wanted to live in um, a brand new college with ensuite facilities, then you could do that. But at the same time, we have a over 1000 year old castle that you could live in if you if you want that quintessentially British university experience as well. We're around 15 minutes away from Newcastle University, which is another Russell Group University that you might have heard of. Up until 1963, Newcastle University and Durham University were both Durham University. Um, in 1963, Newcastle split away from Durham, uh, but we have very close, close links to the university still and work in partnership with them across many academic disciplines. So you might not have recognised the outside of Durham Cathedral, but I can guarantee you've seen the inside of it. So um, the Harry Potter films had scenes filmed there. So all of the scenes that you can see on the screen here were filmed in uh, Durham Cathedral. And slightly more recently than that, the Avengers Endgame had a few scenes filmed there too. So occasionally the Northeast and Durham does play host to international Hollywood films as well. So it is an exciting place to live. So our location in terms of where we sit within the British Isles, we're part of the Northeast of England. Um, I'll just move the, the tile out of the way. Um, so um, we are the purple pin on the map here. Um, the white pin at the top is Edinburgh. We're around 90 minutes south of Edinburgh by train. And then the white pin at the bottom of the map there is London. We're about two and a half to three hours north of London on the train. But the northeast of England is a very pretty part of the country. Lots of golden sand beaches, um, rolling green countryside. There's over 70 castles in the northeast of England, probably because of the history between uh, England and Scotland over the years. So it's quite a fortified area of the country, but lots of history, lots of castles and lots of beautiful green uh, countryside and scenery as well. So it really is a lovely place to live as a student for one to two to three years. So talking about scholarships generally, but uh, Colfuturo specifically. So um, Durham does have an agreement with Colfuturo. So uh, one 100% um, scholarship is awarded to a Colfuturo uh, beneficiary each year as part of a taught, uh, taught postgraduate programme. The other successful Colfuturo uh, students uh, receive a 20% discount on their tuition fee for the duration of their programme. And you can apply, um, so in terms of applying for the, the scholarship, once you've applied through Colfuturo, you would then apply to Durham University. There's no additional 
um, application for that 100% scholarship. So we consider all students that have already applied through Cofuturo and then applied to Durham. Um, so that will be considered as part of your wider application to the university. In terms of our rankings uh, within the UK and worldwide, we're ranked 78th in the world, so a world top 100 university. And we're ranked sixth in the UK, so a UK top 10 and a world top 100 university. We also have 19 subjects ranked within the world top 100 as well, and I'll show you a few of those on the next slide. But just to give a bit of context to the photograph that you can see on the slide here as well, this is Sadler Street, which leads up to the cathedral um, and the castle. But if you're looking for that quintessentially British university experience, you really will get that in Durham with the, the cobbled streets, uh, the independent bookshops and restaurants and winding streets and Georgian townhouses. It really is a lovely city to live in. So here are a handful of our um, of our rankings, uh, subject by subject. So within the QS top 10, we are ranked seventh in the world for theology and religion, eighth in the world for archeology, span and then within a domestic context, we're ranked first in the UK for music, first for criminology, um, but 90% of our individual subjects are ranked within the UK top 10 depending on the rankings that you look at. So we really are very highly ranked across the subjects that we offer at the university. So here's the full spread of subjects that we offer across the four faculties that we are made up of within the university. So we have Durham University Business School and they have the departments of accounting, economic and finance and marketing and management within the faculty. And then there's the faculties of um, of Arts and Humanities, the Faculty of Science and the Faculty of Social Sciences and Health. And then underneath each of those columns are listed the specific subjects within those faculties. But we have over 200 undergraduate programmes and over 100 postgraduate student, um, sorry, 100 postgraduate programmes to select from within those individual departments and subjects. So moving on to the collegiate experience at the university, Durham is a collegiate university. Um, so all students become a member of one of our 17 colleges of residence at the university, but it forms part of your social experience while you are at Durham. Um, so the photo that you can see on the screen here is University College. This is the castle that I was talking about a bit earlier. So if you wanted to live in castle, you could do that. And the way that you apply for your college is that you will do that um, after your application. So you will apply to the university as part of your postgraduate application. And then once you receive, hopefully, a successful outcome on your application, you will be invited to rank your top three colleges, um, and then you will be invited to decide whether you want simply membership at that college, which means you are a member of the college, you're invited to attend um, social events, uh, you can use the facilities within the college, there's formal dinners, um, there's events throughout the year, uh, there's clubs and societies, and then you can utilise the, the staff student support team as well. The other option is that you have membership and accommodation. So you can apply for accommodation in your college as well. So if you didn't want to live in private, privately rented accommodation within the city of Durham, you could decide to live in your um, in your college as an alternative. So it's a lot like the Harry Potter experience. So in Harry Potter, there was four houses, Slytherin, Ravenclaw, Hufflepuff and Gryffindor, whereas at Durham University, we have 17 colleges of residence. Um, so although every student is part of Durham University, they are then part of a specific college within the university in a lot in, in, in similar ways to Harry Potter, where they are all members of um, of Hogwarts, but they are then within their within their within their house. So a bit more detail about what the collegiate experience offers at Durham. So there's lots of traditions within each of the colleges. They have their own common rooms. So there's a junior common room for undergraduate bachelor's students. Um, there's a middle common room for postgraduate students completing their master's degree or their PhD. 
Um, and then there's also a senior common room, which is for uh, staff at the university, academic members of staff, professors, as well as the staff that work within the college itself. And each one of those common rooms within the college organize activities. They each have a president within the junior common room, the middle common room, the senior common room. And they all come together for uh, formal dinners, which are collective joint events. And many of our current students say that the collegiate experience is one of their favorite aspects of coming to Durham University. So there's lots of different factors that you can decide your college choice on, your college ranking. Um, but I would recommend that you don't base it on location within the city because Durham itself is a pretty compact city. And wherever your academic department will be, your college will be relatively close to that. Um, so each of the yellow shields that are on the screen to the right hand side represent one of our 17 colleges. So college number 10 right at the top there is the College of St Hilda and St Bede. And then the college right at the bottom, which is number nine, is Josephine Butler. Um, the distance between them is probably around 20 to 25 minutes walk. And those are the two furthest points on the university site as well, I would say. Um, so it really is quite a compact city and university um, campus as well. Um, so there's quite a wide variety of types of college at the university. The castle was built over a thousand years ago, but as I mentioned, there's also two brand new colleges as well. Um, and you can base your college choice on a number of factors. So you could look at the year that it was founded, so how old the college is, whether it is fully catered or self catered. So if you want to have three meals a day, uh, seven days a week during term time. That is something that you can consider as part of your um, college choices. If you want to live in a self-catered college, then you can you can cut out most of the colleges straight away because most of our colleges are fully catered. Whether they have gown formal dinners or informal dinners might be something that you want to consider. So most of our colleges have formal dinners where students wear gowns to attend those. Um, but if that's not something that you're very interested in, then you, you might not want to consider a college that offers those. Um, if you want to be part of a larger college or a smaller college, you can look at how many students are admitted each year. So our largest college is St Cuthbert, sorry, is Collingwood College with an intake of around 550 students per year um, versus the smallest college, um, which is St John's College. And they have an intake of around 250 um, students per year. So that's St Chad's actually. Um, so much smaller. And it really depends on whether you want a larger college with the facilities to go along with that or a smaller college uh, with that really close knit community feel. We also have one postgraduate only college as well, which is Eustonov College. So if you know that you want to be around purely other postgraduate students within your college community, then I'd recommend that you put Eustonov at the top of your list. So um, moving on to sport at the university, Durham is ranked the number one uh, university for sport and has been since 2013. So again, if that's something else that you're interested in while completing your postgraduate degree, then Durham's a really good place to consider. We have over 700 sports teams um, and we've invested over £32 million into our university sports facilities. So on the photograph here, you can see some of the facilities that we have. This year, we are also ranked Sports University of the Year, so we're very proud of that too. And then towards the end of each year, um, after undergraduate examinations and while postgraduate students are completing their thesis or dissertation, um, there's lots of events within summertime. So we have a, a, a rowing regatta at the end of each year. Each of the colleges have their own college day, which is like a mini festival. So it's a nice way to start to um, wind down towards the end of the year. And then theatre and music. Um, we have 27 theatre companies at the uni university and over 90 student productions are put on each year as well. We're ranked number one in the UK for music. That's our academic music programme. Um, but even if you do not do a postgraduate programme in music, there's over 84 music societies that every student across the university can take part in. And they put on over 80 concerts a year, many of which take place within the cathedral.
cathedral, which apparently has fantastic acoustics. We're also an all Steinway school, so every college at the university has at least one Steinway piano. Um, so if you play piano, they're, they're fantastic pianos that are accessible to all of our students. We're the largest all Steinway school in the UK, um, and we have 61 individual pianos um, that are made by Steinway uh, at the university. So. And then clubs and societies at a university level. So within each of the colleges, there's around 40 to 50 clubs and societies that are open to only members of that college. But then at a university level, we have over 200 clubs and societies that are open to everyone, regardless of their college affiliation or degree program. Um, and we have an over 85% participation rate within our clubs and societies. The national average is around 55%, so we're a good 30% above that. But they can, based on, on a number of different factors, they, they could just be about shared interests, or they could be academic in focus, they could be faith-based, they could be um, about fundraising or charity or community outreach. Um, like I said, they could be just about shared interests. So, for example, we have um, an instant noodle society, we have a bubble tea society, there's a free fall society even. And then volunteering and outreach, we have a dedicated Durham University student volunteering and outreach program and organization. Um, and this is completely student led community projects. We have over 50 of them that you can choose from each year. And each year, um, our students volunteer over 40,000 hours of time. So it's something that we're very, very proud of at the university. And in 2020, um, Durham University received the Queen's Award for Voluntary Service, which is the highest award given to community volunteering in the UK. And it's also very good for your resume or CV um, to go with um, examples of that when you want to apply for jobs um, after you graduate. So this is Helena, one of our current students at the university, and she says, whatever your interests, you will, you will find it at Durham. So student support at the university um, can be split broadly into college support and university support. So we run an induction week at the start of each year that is for both undergraduate and postgraduate international students. And then we run a full uh, welcome week, um, which is for undergraduate and postgraduate students as well. There's a dedicated student support team within each college. Um, you'll receive a mentor. Um, our undergraduate students receive a parent, but you might receive a, a, a fellow um, a mentor within your, your college um, for your postgraduate degree. And then at the university level, we have a counselling service. Uh, you'll receive an academic tutor within your department, within your academic department. We also have a chaplaincy service and a disability support service as well. And then in terms of careers after graduation, we have a dedicated career service open to all students from the day that you arrive at the university to beyond graduation. Um, we're ranked 54th globally for employer reputation. So within the world top 100 uh, universities for employer reputation. So international employers really do understand the value of a Durham degree um, and it stands you in good stead on your CV and in interviews and because of the student experience that you have at the university in addition to the excellent teaching that we offer. Um, we're ranked 10th in the UK for graduate prospects and we have a dedicated Durham International Student Employability Programme as well. So if you didn't want to remain in the UK after you graduate, our career service can help you with applying to those opportunities outside of the UK as well. But more generally, the career service can help you with things like applying to graduate schemes, um, um, to uh, further scholarships, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, they can sit, sit down with you and just go through uh, mock interview questions, or they could really refine your CV or resume a bit more, or they could just talk to you about what kind of career you would like to go into if you're not 100% sure. Um, so that is it from me. Um, so I will leave it there, but that's just a, a general overview of the university. But if anyone does have any questions or if they would like to book an appointment with me, please do feel free to. Um, you can scan the QR code there or you can email me.
I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan, for all the information. So I encourage all the participants to send the questions that you have regarding the university, or maybe if you have questions regarding other topics, you can send your questions in the Q&A box. We have the first one from Mauricio. And the question is, can you give us an estimate of the living costs on Durham? That's a really good question. And, and thank you for, for asking that, Mauricio. Um, so the northeast of England, which is where Durham is in, in the country, is the most affordable part of the UK. Um, so that's, that's a good thing to, to keep in mind. Um, in terms of living costs, I would say around 10,000 US dollars um, would cover living costs. Um, so it, it, it's, it's to, just to give a range, I believe that college accommodation fees will be around £8,000 next year. It depends upon, um, it depends upon the type of college accommodation that you apply for. So if you um, are in a, a college with um, an ensuite bedroom, that will cost more than shared bathroom facilities, for example. But in terms of living expenses, I would say um, it's it's an it's an affordable part of the country, um, but ten thousand US dollars should get you through the full academic year, um, and that could even include flights home as well. Okay, good, thank you. We, then we're gonna go with Santiago, and he's asking, how do you select the beneficiary of the one hundred percent tuition fee waiver, academic merits, work experience, or others? Like, what is the criteria to choose this uh, beneficiary of the 100%? Okay. Absolutely. So, Thank again, you. a fantastic question. Thank you. And it is a holistic pro uh, process, Santiago. Uh, so we have a committee that is made up of staff from the international office, for example. Um, we, all, we also have um, academic members of staff as well. Um, so it really is um, looking at each application on its merit. So we look at... Um, grades that you have achieved in your undergraduate program, so your, your GPA within your undergraduate program, we will look at that. We will look at your personal statement as well. So the strength of your personal statement is really can, taken into consideration as well. Um, what you would like to um, use your degree for, um, what kind of um, career you would like to go into, how you see yourself benefiting from that um, from that um, scholarship as well. So if you're able to talk about um, why you want to do the degree uh, in at Durham and how you see it benefiting your home country once if you if and if and when you return, then that that's a good thing that we we like to see. but it really is, looking at applications on the whole and the strength of the application to the university as well. Um, so, so my best advice is just make your application to the university as strong as it possibly can be, because we will look at that favorably when we're looking at the beneficiary of the, of the 100% tuition waiver as well. Good, thanks. Then we have a frequent question from social media and it's about the work experience in UK in general. So, yeah. can, so can you tell us about that, like how easy or how difficult it is to get a job once they finish the master's or the PhD program? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a number of different things to consider. So each university in the UK will have different employability prospects as well. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, Durham is ranked 54th in the world for employability prospects. So simply by virtue of coming to Durham University, you stand a very good chance because of the, because of the, um, the reputation we have worldwide. So that's one thing that you really do need to research when deciding which university that you're going to go to in the UK and which program you're going to go to. So even within a university, each program will have different employability prospects and pathways as well. So think about that too, when you're applying to your postgraduate programs. And then in terms of things that you can do once you are you once you've commenced your program at the university, there's lots of different things. So I would recommend that you get involved in uh, college activities.
activities. So the clubs and societies that I mentioned, you can take on leadership roles within the middle common rooms within each of our colleges as well. So because our middle common rooms are made up primarily of postgraduate students, they are new every single year. So we have a new cohort of postgraduate students every year. Um, so there will be positions like the president of the middle common room, there'll be a treasury position, a chair of social committees. So I would say throw yourself, in, throw yourself into the, those social activities and leadership roles, apply for them, um, put yourself forward um, and, and do those while you're doing your degree as well. They're not a huge commitment, but they look really good on your CV. So that would be a good thing to consider as well. Those are voluntary, they're unpaid. And then you might want to consider paid opportunities as well while you're in Durham or or the, the any of the other cities that you might you might go to while you're at the, while you're while you're in the UK. So um, there's things like um, open day ambassadors that you can you can become you can become a student librarian you could work behind the bar or you could work in a restaurant or a bookshop within the city so those are the types of things that you should consider as well. Okay. Yes, thank you. And then the other frequent questions that we have is about the language requirement. So we as Spanish speakers, we need to know if we have to present a specific exam for applying for the master's abroad. So maybe can you tell us about this language requirement in general in the university? Absolutely. So um, it's tricky to put a specific um, grade on the English language requirements because we, we accept different providers. Um, but we also, but then within each of the programs, there's often different English language requirements as well. So my best advice would be once you know which program that you're interested in, if you type in Durham University English language requirements, we have a full table which breaks down all of the providers that we accept and the ones that we don't accept and the specific um, the specific requirements that we would we would have within those. The most common that we see is IELTS, and I would recommend that you that you look into into IELTS as well. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And then we have one question from Santiago, and the question is: How many students does a class usually have? Yeah, another fantastic um, question and quite tricky to answer as well. Um, it depends on the department. There's different staff to student ratios within each of the departments. Um, lectures can be very, very large. They can be 100 students, 150 students. But within those lectures, that is your opportunity to do reading beforehand, come to the lecture, allow the professor at the front to go through all of the content that they want to go through for that week. Um, and then you will just absorb that, take notes, really listen to what they have to say, and then do reading afterwards. So it doesn't really matter how many students are in that lecture, but then attached to that lecture, there will be a seminar or a workshop or a tutorial, and those will be much smaller um, classrooms. So often between eight and 12 students will be in that in that class. So a much smaller classroom environment, um, but there's a lot of, there's lots of different learning and teaching methods, including those large lectures, but the much smaller seminars and tutorials as well. Okay, good. Then we have uh, Jimmy's question. And he's saying, I would like to know what is the intake percentage of acceptance the university has for master's degree? Yeah, a, another great question, Jimmy. Um, we don't have acceptance rates in the UK, so it's it's tricky to put a figure on that. We, we look at each application on the basis of its own merit. We have very transparent academic entry requirements. So if you know that you are on track to meet our academic entry requirements, you can be pretty confident that you, you should receive a successful outcome on your application. You just need to make sure that as I said, one, you're on track to meet our academic entry requirements and two, that your personal statement is is strong and that you follow the guidance that that is set out that I've mentioned at the start of this. You talk about why you are you are appropriate for that program, why you're interested in it, um, which which aspects you're most interested in and what you want to go on to afterwards. So as long as you hit those key criteria, um, it's likely that you as an individual would get an offer. If you don't meet those criteria, then I would say that the likelihood is very is very small. Okay, good. Then we have another question about the GPA. 
and they are asking if there is a like a minimum GPA to apply for the programs. Yes, there is. So I don't have that to hand um, immediately, actually, but I, I can certainly I can put that in the chat at the end if that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then let me check. I have a good one. So they're asking if there is any problem if I want to travel with my family, with my kids, with my husband. Do you have like any options to help these uh, students that want to travel with the family? Yeah, the, the UK government actually has really good guidance on their website about uh, travel visas, student visas and dependents as well. So it's a, it's a really clear website, actually. Um, so I would say if you type in UK government visa requirements, um, the, it, it's set out really, really clearly there. Um, if not, if you would like to get in touch with me individually to talk about that, then I'd be more than happy to, to talk about your individual circumstances. Yeah. Thank you. And the next question is about the estimated cost of a program. So we know that they are different, but maybe an estimated cost would be like, can you give us that information? Yeah, absolutely. So our programs range from £21,000 up to £33,000. Um, so th th that's quite a wide, uh, quite, a, quite a wide range, I understand. Um, but all of our tuition fees are listed on the individual course uh, web pages. So again, if you type into Google Durham University, um, uh, Master of Art in English Literature, it will have the international fees listed on that page. Yeah. Now we're going to conclude uh, this questions and answer uh, section with the last question from social media, and it's like a piece of advice. Like, what would be the five or four tips that you can give students to have a successful admission process? Yeah, I would say do your research. So um, do your research, research in terms of what types of universities you want to apply to. So have a look at the rankings. I'd say have a look at the Russell Group and see whether those are the types of universities that you want to apply to. Um, really look at the academic entry criteria for each university because in the UK um, if you are on track to meeting the international uh, academic entry criteria um, you stand a very good chance of getting an offer from those universities so just make sure that you are on track to fulfilling what the universities actually look for like I said we don't have acceptance rates so it's not that you need to meet this criteria on the website and then we only accept 50% of those students it's more like that that if you meet that 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 criteria then it's likely that you would it would get an offer um go onto the websites um look at the personalities of the universities and see whether you are a good fit for that university town as well because you will be living there you will be doing that degree in that city but first and foremost you need to know that you you are going to enjoy living in in durham or manchester or london Yeah, so uh, as I said before, we do not have more questions. So thank you so much, Nathan, for being here for the presentation, for answering all the questions. We have here the QR, the QR code that is for book an appointment. So if you have like any question, you can use this uh, QR that Nathan gave us. And also, if you have questions regarding Call Futuro, you can send an email. Let me just uh, send it by the chat. If you have questions regarding our scholarship program, you can just send a message to josefuturo arroba colfuturo Yeah. Okay. So thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.